Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 499th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we have Leray Kwai. She spent 24 years in the FBI, um, worked with the CIA as well um, on negotiations, on undercover work, um, some crazy things. And we talk about mental toughness. She has a mental toughness assessment. Um, She has a second edition of her book, Secrets of a Strong Mind, How to Build Inner Strength to Overcome Life's Obstacles. Um, So if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a salesperson, if you're a business owner, uh, if you're leading people, then you you know you need this, right? You've got to be tough. What are you doing to make yourself stronger? Um, I look back on... You know, doing this Tampa Bay Frogman swim and doing it now for seven years. I was like, what the hell did I get myself into? Back in 2011, did that the Tough Mudder out here. That was brutal. Uh, but training for the swim and then jumping in that water, it, it was a checkup from the neck up. Doing jujitsu since January 2017. Literally every day I'm challenged. Every day I'm like, what the heck am I doing? Last night. Um, I went Monday night. It was, uh, my mom was in town. My son was in town. We went wine tasting. We had a little HOA takeover planning meeting, um, had a little beer and that, that evolved into some scotch and pizza. I mean, I did not do what I should have done on that Sunday. So Monday I was kind of hurting. I felt that 51 years, but I went and rolled, you know, I didn't go in the morning. I didn't go in the evening uh, and I'm glad I went. I learned something. I was able to teach someone as well. And in teaching, I taught myself some of the nuances, some of the subtleties that I had taken for granted. Uh, So, but every time it makes me tougher. It makes me glad that I went. I see the things um, that I've got to do in every avenue of my life to succeed. And that's just how it is. You know, you talk about work-life balance and yeah when you're pushing for something you're going to be unbalanced for a while so that's all right as long as you know it's for a while but you need to dig in when the time calls for it you need to know that you've got that gear that you have that intensity to do what it takes for as long as it takes to get done what needs to get done Um, I think we've coasted for too long as a society, as a culture. Um, Some crazy things are happening with the economy. Um, Make hay while the sun shines, right? You better be digging down now and peeling back things and looking under the rocks, understanding um, where the bad guys could be hiding, where the boogeyman is, uh, because the boogeyman will come out in the next 12 to 24 months. So do you have what it takes to build up the reserves Right now, do you have what it takes to weather the storm when it does come? Because it will come. There's always another storm. So are you ready? You know, uh, yesterday I just started a a five-week intensive working with um, a software as a service company and um, teaching 21 of their partners how to sell, you know, and, and we're getting deep and I'm giving them specific things to do. Um specific verbiage to to shape and apply to their business Uh, and i'm telling them to go do all right so as you listen to this don't just be entertained don't just use it as a distraction for a moment and go back to whatever use this to learn internalize these lessons if you need help reach out okay I've got on-demand courses. I've got private coaching. I've got the weekly calls that we do. All of them are affordable. And you know what? If they're not affordable, then my question is, why not? And the second question is, what are you going to do about it? Is your current state of mind, your current thinking, your current actions, your current knowledge, current wisdom, your current insight, is it enough to get you from where you are to where you want to be. If it's not, then dig in. Okay? Invest in yourself. Spend the money. Make it hurt. When you spend enough money on something, you'll focus. It gets your attention. Okay? So if that's what it takes, fine. 
I'll be your huckleberry. I will slap you around if that's what's needed. Okay? But you've got to do these things. You've got to do the work. Every time when I'm teaching new people jujitsu, I'm showing them the fundamentals. I, I literally tell them every time, say, hey, you know how we do our warm-ups? Yeah. You know that, that one drill? Yeah. This is when you use that. And they go, oh. Hey, you know the other drill that we do? The other warm-up? Yeah. This is when you add that on to that one. Oh. It's like you thought we were just doing things for shits and grins, huh? No. Everything we do in our warm-ups has a reason, has a purpose. I've talked about this before. You know, even the Air Force Academy, when you're a freshman, a four degree, a smack, a soldier minus ability, not what a soldier minus ability, coordination, and knowledge, a smack. <laughs> you know, they make you sit at the front of your seat, your chin in, your shoulders back and down, your eyes come uh, caged, looking at the, the, the Air Force emblem at the 12 o'clock position on your plate. The reason they make you do that is to develop your peripheral vision. It's good when you're looking for bad guys coming to shoot you down. It's good if you are shot down you're looking for bad guys trying to shoot you on the ground. So all these little things, you know, they, they pound into our skulls for a reason. So when I cover how you talk, how you sit, how you stand, how you make eye contact, uh, how you finish a sentence, how you set up the meeting, how you're doing the work way before you ever engage with them. There's a reason. Because deep down, I don't want to be in sales. I want to make sales. I want, to, I want the money that making sales gives me. And so thinking through this, mapping it all out, making sure the odds are stacked in my favor, that's how you make every sale. To make any sale, you must make every sale. Every step along the way must be right. Because a confused mind says no, and time kills deals. So, there you have it. If you need help in those areas, hit me up. Let's get after it. Okay? You can go to makeeverysale.com, get the stuff on demand. You can get that and me live every week and ask questions at any time in the group at sellmoreofeverything.com. Invest in yourself and grow. You'll be glad you did. Now let's bring on our guest. Larray Kwai, all the way from Scottsdale, former counterintelligence FBI agent uh, and author of Secrets of a Strong Mind, How to Build Inner Strength to Overcome Life's Obstacles. Welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you? I am doing well. and Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to your audience. So I was, I saw one of your videos. You grew up on a cattle ranch in Wyoming <laughs> where fast food is hitting a deer at 60 miles an hour. So I'm like, all right, I like her. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much my life. Uh, my grandmother had ammo on her Christmas list. So I, I learned to take orders and not sass back and not whine and complain when I didn't want to do something. Hey, you know what? Ammo is still on my Christmas list. <laughs> too dang expensive. <laughs> you remember that guy? The, the rent is too dang high. That guy running for office. Well, the ammo is too dang high. That's going to be my platform when I run for office. <laughs> it's astronomical. Yeah, um, but no, it was, it, was a, it was a great upbringing. And it's actually, um, when I interviewed with the FBI, that's one of the things they really liked about me, that I wasn't spoiled, you know, that right. I wasn't entitled. I knew, how to, uh, I knew how to get out there and work, you know, stack bales or, or uh, you know, work cattle, ride horses, all, the, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I spent one short, quick trip <laughs> to my friend's grandfather's ranch in Huntsville, north of Houston. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. And we bulldogged cattle. They were, he was waiting for us. And it was, he was waiting for the summer. So they were too old. I mean, they weren't too yeah. old. They were older than they should have been. So they were yeah. big. Yeah. And had to dehorn them and castrate them and brand them. And they were, um, you know, like 400 pounds instead of 200 pounds. And yeah, it was that like, was way too late. And it's so much harder on the calves. Yeah, when it was it, it was work. And then we're bailing yeah. hay. And I'm like, 
now I know why these boys up here are so tough in football. <laughs> they don't need gyms or weight rooms. They're just they're just they just fed. work every day and I mean, every day they work. That's just the the that's just part of the life there. And the thing about a cattle ranch is there's just no room for whining or making excuses yeah. for yourself because you basically have the lives of hundreds of head of cattle that depend on you getting the job done. Right. So um, when it, you know, their lives depended on you, so you had to take it take it seriously. It's hard work. Boy, ranching is, I love it. I love animals, but ranching is really hard work. Yeah. So how do you go from Wyoming to the FBI? It seems like a big <laughs> jump. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it, it, it is. Um, it was. Um, I, I knew that I wanted, when I graduated from high school, I wanted to go get out. I wanted to get a degree. And, and I just knew that if I didn't leave then, I probably never would. Uh, and I just wanted to experience a little bit more what the world had to to offer. Mm-hmm. And so I, but my first job out of college was as a, as a uh, department store buyer for like a, at a fancy department store. And I did not care for that job at all. I mean, at the end of the day, the, I, I looked at my life and I said, so I'm, I'm persuading women to to, to buy polka dots this year instead of stripes. I mean, it just wasn't what I wanted. So I went back to school to get my master's at ASU and the FBI came on campus and um, they, I, I just interviewed with them. I'd never, even though I'd grown up on a, a remote cattle ranch in Wyoming with lots of deer and elk and everything, I'd never shot a gun, but uh, the Bureau loved that because that way they could teach me the right way to shoot, you which was any the bad FBI way, right? Yep. So, um, th- but th- like I said earlier, they, they just liked the fact that I, I could get, I, you know, I wasn't spoiled. I wasn't all prissy, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so I just kind of fell into that position, but um, it's interesting because I talk a lot about values. And I mean, if you know, if you want to persist at something and have the grit to make it through the mental toughness uh, you have to, you know, you've, you, you must be, you must care about what you do, otherwise you'll give up, right? And I internally, when I got into the beer, I found out that FBI internally stands for fidelity, bravery, and integrity. And uh, I knew right then, that's how I was raised uh, with those kind of values. And so uh, I just knew it was going to be a good fit. It was just a, it was just, it was a God-given thing. Nice. Uh, and like I said, I was watching one of your videos, you, you mentioned espionage. And I guess people, we usually think of the CIA as doing espionage. Uh, but I mean, the CIA technically, officially has to work outside of our borders, right? And then when it's happening here, the FBI gets involved. That's exactly right. Um, so whether it be counterintelligence, and so just to, to, to differentiate between the two, counterintelligence was identifying foreign spies that came into this country to steal uh, classified or proprietary information. Espionage is when the U.S. citizen is spying for another country. And so if that person is, let's just say, been recruited by the Russians or the Chinese, and they work at some, you know, some either political think tank or defense related or uh, Silicon Valley high tech, uh, they're stealing that information and then forwarding it, giving it to this uh, foreign intelligence service or foreign country. So that's espionage. Uh, So we work both, but we would work with the CIA a lot of times because obviously uh, if you have a foreign government, they're going to be the foreign partners over there working the same cases. So we coordinated quite uh, frequently and closely. So 24 years doing that. And then you, I mean, that's a full career. Um, And then how did you make that transition? Uh, Because a lot of people, they'll go coast after that. Like you got a, you got a pension, you got healthcare, you know, go back to Wyoming, raise some cattle. I mean, (laughs) why did you decide to, to get into this mental toughness space? Uh, Let me just qualify why I didn't go back to Wyoming to raise cattle. Because I don't know if you've ever been in a Wyoming winter, but um, I spent 18 years in Wyoming winters, actually more than that, because I came home for school. But um, and so that's why I know Wyoming, um, which is because of the weather. It's brutal. I got to tell you, it's brutal. Um, but as far as mental toughness, I, 
Um, actually, the first thing I did was I went back and got a graduate degree uh, at San Francisco Theological Seminary in spiritual direction. And um, most people question, what, how do you go from being a, a, you know, an FBI agent working spies to uh, um, you know, being a spiritual director? And I just said, you know, it's the easiest transition in the world because the FBI taught me to always look at to pull back layers and continue to dig down and find out what's really going on with a person or their, whatever's going on in the case. Uh, and the spiritual spiritual life is much the same way. Uh, only it's myself I'm pulling layers off from to get to the the heart of the matter, or perhaps in the, if you're a director, somebody else. So you work with other people. It's all about communication, though, and and taking the time to um, appreciate who they are, getting their point of view, and then taking it a bit d- deeper so that you're sharing a little bit more about who you are. Got you. So. So you make that transition and then, you know, this mental toughness um, seems to be, I don't know if uh, in vogue is the right name. Um, You know, it's funny how things come and go, but I mean, the reality is anybody that's ever done anything noteworthy in life was tough, right? Physically tough, mentally tough um, is uh, but th- does it seem like it's more of a fad right now, even though it should be just ingrained in this? Like, was it, was it not taught for a couple of generations? Like how, uh, how do we arrive at this point? You know, I have to tell you, I think uh, a lot of people these days have had it so easy uh, that they haven't had to dig down. They really, um, this, this thing we're going through right now is tough. I mean, whether it be COVID or, or the economy or the political divisiveness or the uh, racial uh, equity we're looking at, um, it, it's, it's hard. It's a hard time in history. It's a good time. Most, most good things are hard. That's kind of the point. And uh, I just think now uh, a lot of people are realizing, I mean, it's been such a, hey, look at me, I'm so cool kind of culture for so long that uh, this is really the first time a lot of people have had to dig down and even uncover what's important to them, even care about it because it's all about selfies, right? And the biggest cars and whatever, being, being popular, whatever it happens to be. So I think the great generation uh, grew up with the resilience, with the grit, with the mental toughness, they went through some hard times. Uh, We've had it pretty easy here, really, to be truthful. So as far as being mentally tough, it's basically just your mindset. It's you change your mindset, you change your behavior, you change the outcome. And that is where you have to take responsibility or the individual has to take responsibility rather than you know, blaming somebody else or pointing fingers or expecting your parents to make life easy for you or whatever it happens to be. So, I mean, I, I agree like a hundred percent. It's my dilemma is always like the people who need this book will not admit that they need this book. Mm-hmm. And the people who don't need this book uh, we'll probably buy it anyway, to maybe to iron sharpens iron. Have you kind yeah. of found yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, I love that iron sharpens iron to iron sharpens iron. It's one of my favorite, um, verses actually. Um, I have found interesting that you're asking this question now because I'm working on corporate training programs and, um, there's more of a, I want to say humility, but uh, I think there's more of an understanding that maybe we, we don't have all the answers. And so maybe we do need to reach out and, and, and even dig into our own personalities a bit more and try to understand how we can become more in control of our own life rather than just being a, a witness to it, you know? And so I, I, I don't know. It's a great observation, a great question. I find that people are intrigued by how they can become develop a stronger mind how they can become more mentally tough there's the first thing people think mental toughness is just bulldozing their way through obstacles 
And um, that might work in football, but it doesn't work in life. So I, I think there's a curiosity there uh, about what mental toughness is, what resilience is. So it's not just bulldozing. Uh, we <laughs> we no, may have to end not. this interview. Uh, all, all of my questions were around bulldozing. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that's a concept a lot of people have, you know, about uh, what mental toughness is. And it's uh, applied to athletes so much. And I think that's another, you know, sort of metaphor. It's like mentally tough athletes. And I get that there is a lot of mental toughness to be a good athlete, but it means pushing yourself through an obstacle and, 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 and making it through to the other side. Mm-hmm. Well, and I noticed too, uh, and I mean, it's, it's even in, in the book, in your titles, I see it on, on Twitter, right? You've got an emphasis on women. Um, do women, are, are they stuck between a rock and a hard place? Because a lot of times, if they are firm, if they are strong, then they're seen as bitchy, you know, pushy. Uh, are they, are women in a no-win situation? You know, I, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> I do appreciate and understand that a lot of women do feel, feel that they hit a glass ceiling and that there's only, there's nowhere to go and there's no support. Um, <clears throat> I guess part of it was my upbringing in that I think everybody uh, uh, has this, uh, com- this confrontation. Uh, I don't know of any guy, any man that I worked with that got things just handed to them because they were a guy. And I kind of took the same approach um, and if, if I felt like somebody wasn't giving me a fair shake, I just, I just ran over them with competence. I was just competent. And I made sure I was as competent or more competent than my, my, my colleague. Uh, did I, did I uh, actually find that the bureau was hard because I was a woman? Um, I found that it was hard on anybody who was weak to be truthful. It wasn't just because I was a woman. It was because I hadn't prepared or I wasn't physically as, as adept at maybe one of my colleagues. So it's something I had to work on. I had to work for push-ups. I, they didn't come naturally for me. So I, could I have said, oh, you know, that's, I'm, a, I'm a female. I shouldn't have to do that much. But you know what? Yeah, if we want to be, if we want to be treated equal, yeah, we do have to do the same stuff. So no exceptions. And that's my that's kind of my hard rule. So do I think women are between a rock and a hard spot? I think if they see themselves as a victim, they will become a victim. There's no doubt about it. But there are so many women out there who have already forged this path. It's not like the women who are listening now, it's like, oh my God, I'm the first one. I mean, I'm having to, to break the through the snow here, the snow plow, because no one's been before me. There have been hundred so many women who have been very competent and have paved the way for younger women today that um i don't really i don't really think that's an excuse to be truthful yeah okay cool hey i'm i'm down with that i have five daughters so um i i don't coddle any of them and my oldest son you know he's the first born two boys and five girls and you know my oldest son he's He's got a vision uh, disorder. He's legally blind, Um, but you wouldn't know it. He's a computer programmer. It's the craziest thing. (laughs) He, I I, I get, I get vertigo. I I get, I get car sick watching him because he, he has to zoom in on everything. Right. So he's constantly, and he has all these shortcuts on his, on his keypad and and keyboard and everything. He's zooming in, zooming out, moving. And, and I'm like, dude, I'm getting busy, you know? And yeah. we never cut him any slack, right? Every now and then, like my wife, it would kind of hit her, you know, she'd get yeah. emotional, like he'll never drive. And the crazy thing is he got his driver's license, but he doesn't drive, <laughs> doesn't drive by choice because it is getting worse. Yeah, um, no, but, but your point is so well taken. It, 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 and it's just this coddling idea yeah. and I, it's become so pervasive. Yeah. And I, I, if, I mean, I just say parents don't, don't try to make the road easy, prepare them for the road. Because yeah. the road is not, is not going to be easy. I mean, pain, life is hard. Pain is inevitable, but growth, that's optional. So yeah. be sure you're on the right side of that equation. Yeah. Um, so what are some things, I mean, this is a good time to talk about mental toughness, right? It's, it's as good a time as any. Um, the, 
And the, the reason I like it now, um, there's a guy, retired Navy SEAL, I kind of know, uh, Jocko Willink. I don't know if you've heard of I uh, have it. Yeah, Jocko podcast, super successful, uh, made the transition to business, but he he was in charge of training for like the West Coast SEALs and okay. did a lot in Iraq. But he, he talked about how he would hit his guys the hardest after they thought the mission was done. Mm. Right? Because they, they would draw it all up and say, okay, we're going to come in, hit the target, blah, blah, blah. You know, then we're out. Yeah, Because he's like, you, you let your guard down, right? Hey, I got the objective done, blah, blah, blah. We took out the bad guys. Everybody's safe. Let's head, let's head back for a beer. Yeah. But, but it's like, you're not safe. You know, when you're in a foreign land, right? In a war zone, you're not safe till you're back behind the wire. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they would kind of let their guard down. And then he would just hammer them. And I feel like people are thinking that right now. They think COVID's over. They think uh, the economy is just going to bounce back. It's going to be the glory days. The roaring 20s are here. Uh, and, you know, I'm not a negative person. I'm just, I'm looking around like, I see some storm clouds. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know? Yeah, like, no, uh, you talk to any investor, they're seeing storm clouds. Right? Yeah, we're not out of this. So I'm now, uh, when people want to let their guard down, I'm like, I think they better ratchet this thing up and get even tougher for what's yeah. about to come. Yeah. So, so what are some, you know, we still want them to buy your book, you know, and we're linking to it, but like, what's a nugget we can thank you for that share <laughs> uh, to get mentally tough. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and I've, the book covers a lot of topics and, and I thought about this as like, before I joined you today and I, I'm thinking, you know, I, for your audience, um, yeah, there may be a shit storm ahead. I mean, I, there most likely will be. And I was thinking positive thinking would be, you know, it's a corner, kind of a cornerstone of uh, mental toughness, uh, positive thinking. And do you want me to, I can give you an example of how I had to use positive thinking if you sure. want to talk about an FBI story. I don't know if you, does that sound okay? Sure. Um, it, it kind of... Um, dovetails with what you were just saying so at the first day of my uh, of class in the fbi academy we all stood up and introduced ourselves and one guy was a, a former marine who had fought terrorists in in north africa and you know another guy was this was this um lawyer from new york who had brought down an organized crime gang and then yet another was a police officer, you know, all these stories, right? And when I stood up and told them that I was a buyer at a fancy department store, they all just kind of turned to get a look at the fluff ball that had accidentally gotten into the FBI. And then things got really bad. One of our physical fitness requirements at the academy was to dive off a 20 foot diving board while holding an M16 rifle and then swim to the other side of the pool with the weapon. And I had two problems. I was afraid of heights and I'd never learned to swim. No need on a cattle ranch in the middle of Wyoming. So as my training class and my instructors all waited for me to jump, I seriously doubted that in real life, I'd need to, to jump into a pool of water with an M16 while chasing a suspect. But it was something I had to do to graduate. And I was watched as even, you know, experienced swimmers came up gagging. And um, I... I just knew that if I took a step off that diving board, I'd die. But I knew if I didn't take that step, my dream of becoming an FBI agent would be the thing to die. So I instinctively kind of came up with, okay, what, um, what can go right here? What can, is the positive in my situation? And first is I'd never heard of a new agent drowning at the academy. And I thought that was the kind of information that would get around uh, the, the FBI wouldn't want the lawsuit that my parents would launch against them if I did drown. Um, my coach was an excellent swimmer and he could save me. I had put on a life jacket. And I think probably more, most importantly, was I felt certain that a career in the FBI was my path forward. Um, I took a step and jumped. And I, I did bounce back to the su surface with the weapon and I basically crawled <laughs> to the other side at the bottom of the pool. It wasn't pretty, but I made it. And so, you know, it's one of those things where even we're in the middle of a, of a, of a situation, an obstacle, whatever, um, 
to take the time to think and, and, and research has shown that we need to come up with about five positive thoughts to counter each one negative thought. So it's, it, I mean, your friend and you probably have heard this already, you have to hunt the good stuff, right? I mean, that's a term that we hear in, in military, hear at, at law enforcement a lot. So why, why so many positives? Because I, I mean, I've heard something similar, something like you know, 90% of our thoughts are, are negative, counterproductive, and self-defeating. I mean, why, why are we so hard on ourselves? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a really, thank you. It's a really great question, Wes. Um, uh, actually, because I, I, what I like to do and what I talk about and what I write about really is I marry neuroscience with social psychology. And so when you get to the bottom of a question like that, which is an excellent question, because we are hard on ourselves. We are. We are always our own worst critic. Um, but it, there's, there's a scientific, there's a neuro, there's a, neuroscience can explain that because the brain is wired to be negative. It's just, and the reason is not because the brain is some sort of sadist, but because it can keep us safe. Its primary job is to keep us safe. So um, it pays more attention to negative information because it could be a threat to our safety. So, it, it, and I didn't say this, uh, Rick Hansen came up with this, but good news is like Teflon, it just slides away. Bad news is like Velcro, it sticks. Um, and so we do have to work harder to find the good stuff because our brain, while it's nice and it's fluffy and all warm and stuff, it's, it's, it's not, if our brain will turn immediately if something negative comes up so we can pay attention to it so we can evaluate whether that's going to hurt us in some way you know but not everything that's negative is a threat to our safety anymore in caveman days it really mattered or if you're in iraq um you know behind a, an enemy line but for most of us it's uh, we need to take the time to think through it so what exactly is this, is this positive thinking though? Because that's, I remember uh, I was at the Air Force Academy and we, I got there in 88. So there was still a whole lot of lessons learned and, and being discussed from Vietnam, you know, yeah. and uh, Admiral Stockdale, Medal of Honor winner, um, not too long later, 92, right? He was running with Ross Perot uh, yeah. as his vice president. Um, but he, he was the ranking member in, in the Hanoi Hilton, right? So he was kind of leading yes. things and, um, and they asked him, you know, who, who made it and who didn't like, what, what do they have in common? He said, oh, it's easy. And he said, you know, the guys that didn't make it were the ones, and I, I don't know if it was like positive thinking, but he, he was yeah. the guys that didn't make it. They're like, oh, we're going to be home by, by Easter. And the Easter yeah. came and yeah. went. We'll be home by Memorial Day. We'll be home by Christmas. And then they just lost hope and died. That's exactly right. So this what, is a great story. So what, what's the nuance there? What, were, they, were they hopeful thinking versus positive thinking? Like what's the, the subtlety there You so know, get it right? Mm-hmm. Positive thinkers are not optimists. Um, there's a difference. Um, positive thinkers believe they will prevail in their circumstances without expecting their circumstances to change. Optimists do expect their circumstances to change and for the better. And that was as Stockdale had pointed out in, in his book and, and a book written about him, uh, they just kind of lost hope. They wouldn't adjust, they couldn't adjust. It was always about, um, about something that was gonna change in their environment. Well, it's like, it's like, I don't know if you've ever heard this uh, by Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor. His whole family was killed. He was the only one that survived. And he, and he said, you know, at some point when, I can, when you can't change your circumstances, you're challenged to change yourself. That's what Stockdale did. I mean, he was a positive thinker. If he had, you know, if he had bugs in his rice, he was thankful for the protein. Uh, if he had a broken arm or some other issue, he was, he was glad that he had his other arm or leg or whatever. He always looked for the positive. And, um, and that's a positive thinker. You, you believe you will prevail 
you know, rather than expecting your circumstances to change. Uh, and, and, you know, positive, positive thinkers, uh, it's, it's, it's not wishing or hoping all things that are bad in your life will go away because at some point we learn, at some point we learn life is not always fair and nor can it be predicted. So um, he, they just, he just adapted. Positive thinkers adapt to their circumstances without ever losing hope. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. That's a good differentiator. I want to make sure we touch on because it's, yeah, it's, it's nuanced, right? It's, it um, is. yeah. And I, I tell people, you know, hope, hope is not a strategy, right? No. Uh, so. no. But it can be the end result though. Right. I mean, you know, of, of when you, again, it's your mindset. It's yeah. how you look at yourself and your circumstances. You change the mindset, you change your behavior, you change the outcome. So um, Stockdale's story is a brilliant one. And thank you for bringing that up. That's just an excellent illustration. Yeah. Um, you know, four years ago, June 2017, I started writing a daily post on the Bible. Uh, Cause there was this guy that I follow and I still know him. Uh, he's just, he's a little too edgy and foul mouth for, um, I mean, I, I still like him. I mean, Hey, I grew up in the military and in sports, you know, <laughs> I can make a sailor blush. It's just not you know, my, it's you, not you, my default. You know what mode. I say? I can't is the only four letter word I've never heard in the FBI. <laughs> oh, I can't do that. I can't do that, that, this, whatever. So I hear what you're saying. It's just not my default mode of no. communication, Bro, but if no, he has no. a big influence, I'm like, well, okay, that's my fault for not having a bigger presence to give people an alternative message, right? So, I mean, for almost four years now, every day, I've written that, and, mm -mm. you know, just over and over <laughs> again, you see, you know, the suffering servant, uh, and I... And it, it boggles my mind, it saddens me in a way as well, you know, that so many people are you know, they say they're strong in their faith. And then you see them in the next breath whining and moaning about, Oh, woe is me. I'm like, yeah. well, which is it? <laughs> you know, are, yeah. you, are yeah. you, are you that suffering servant? You, you say you're a good Christian and, and you're down with everything. It's like, well, pick up your cross. You know, everybody's like, well, it's an old growth uh, wood and some spotted owl was, was dehomed. Uh, to make this cross. So I shouldn't be forced to carry it. I'm like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. I think so it sounds I, like an excuse myself. Yes. So I hope your book is selling a lot because people need this. We we're not mentally tough, uh, but can it, can it be self-taught? Right. Can I get a book and be tougher or do I need to like join a group? There's all these men's groups and stuff. Come and come sit in the cold water and it's like a, it's like a baby Navy seal, you know? Yeah, I, I know. 72 and hour indoctrination. They all dress in black suits <laughs> oh, and they got rings and I'm like, Oh my gosh. But I think it, it it's I've needed, unfortunately. Too. Yeah. Uh, they're making a lot of money from those little oh things you're gosh. talking about those weekends or you walk on coals or you yeah. sit out in the cold or whatever. They're making a lot of money from it, but um, in a week they'll forget. I mean, it, it has to come from within. So what you're talking about, whether it be faith um, related or, and actually I think people of faith find it easier to do the hard work and to go inside to uncover what's really important to them. Because so many people, it's such a, a shallow world we live in right now that most people are living someone else's values, uh, you know, that, that they think they're supposed to live by because they admire a person or that's what they're told uh, is the right thing or social media is responsible for so much of this and is quite um, actually need, carries a lot of responsibility for where people are going these days. But uh, actually what I find is important to stand firm or grit or whatever you're talking about is you have to understand what your values are and you have to do that inner work to even know what your values are. I mean, I, I can ask somebody, you know, what are your values? 
And they'd say, and they'd be hard pressed to even know what I mean. It's like, uh, well, I got a great car. I've got a new house. I mean, you know, I've got jewelry, whatever the thing is, but I'm talking about values. And um, that's where if you really, if you love what you do, if something is important to you, you will have the grit to follow through on what you've started. Uh, we must believe in what we're doing. Otherwise we'll just give up when the going gets tough. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that was Frankel was quoting Nietzsche. What name was saying? Like, if you if you're, if yeah. your why is big enough, you'll figure out how basically something to. Yeah. He did say something like that. that you're point. exactly right. right. Um, I'm just a big man's search for meaning. I'm a big Victor Frankl fan and he's influenced a lot of my, of my thinking. Right. And, and what I, just what I, what I, what I write about to be truthful. Right. Uh, So you, so you leave the FBI, you enter the uh, theology program uh, when did you launch your own business though? Like, was it right away or did you, did you take some time and then I mean, did you stumble upon it or was it like, was it always a vision you had to, to do this? Um, you know, I've always wanted to write. That's something, um, even when I was in college, I wanted to do, I took writing classes and art classes, but you know, there was a part of me that said, I'll never make a living as a writer and I've got to pay the rent. Right. So, um, I, decided after I retired I well first of all retirement is such a I think it's a misnomer uh I I, I guess people really do sit on their butts you know after they retire and do nothing but you know I don't know maybe they play golf all day every day or I don't know what they do but that's not normal I it's just not normal it's not even healthy and so it's like when I left the bureau then it gave me an opportunity to craft something that I really wanted to do something that um, was was important to me and um and that was writing and um and so that's why I started doing I started my blog and I started uh writing a book Uh, I read the first edition and it was you know it was what, almost 10 years ago. And so I've ch- my, my writing has improved and that's why I came out with a second edition. But I think one of the biggest things that really came out for me was, you, you know, you hear this so much. It's like, well, well, I don't know. What should I do? Well, you should follow your passion. Going, <laughs> oh my God, if I hear that one more time, I'll just die. Um, because, you know, following your passion is is all about you. What, 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 what turns you on? And it, okay, so for at some point in life, you may want to go a little bit deeper than that and not just all about you, but purpose asks a very different question. It asks what we can contribute to the world, what we can contribute to others. Then you start, you start digging down a little bit, bit deeper. You realize, first of all, you're not your own God, uh, that maybe there's somebody else in the world beside you that matters. Uh, and, and really, it takes people, it can take people a while to get to that point. If I, I, I know several young people who are well ahead of me, were, they were farther ahead than I was at their age, that's for sure. And I, I'm like, wow, I had to wait so many years to, to kind of move to that point. But, uh, and so that's what, that's, it's about purpose, I think now, more than just, uh, you know, what I like to do. And believe me, the, the FBI with the values that it holds uh, kept me there for 24 years and I loved it. Um, but now I'm thinking there's a sense of purpose there too. You're helping victims, but this is a different kind of purpose for me myself. So you never chased a bad guy with an M16. Did you rope any of them at least? Like hit them with a cattle prod or something? Um. <laughs> no. Did you fish? Did did you get them loose in the like NASCAR and get them loose in the corner and crash them into a light pole? Um, no. Uh, you know, um, I I have a lot of just come to Jesus moments stories uh, because of the bureau and and arrests and holding a gun. And when you hold a gun at a person, you you realize what power you have and how 
responsible you must be mm-hmm. in order to make sure that that person is not hurt or that you're not hurt because at some point it could go either way right so um you know again it was um being sort of honest Uh, if you have time i'll tell you a short kind of a short story about that um it was my first arrest in uh in my first arrest and i was with my training agent and he was after a guy who was considered armed and dangerous and he had a lead and he got the SWAT team, FBI SWAT team all lined up and we were, oh, the, the plan, you know, we had a plan and it was the SWAT, we, we would follow this guy. And when he came, came to a, a red light, we would, a red board, we call it, but a red light, um, we, the SWAT team would jump out and arrest him, like, just like we trained in the FBI Academy, right? And so, but it was traffic and we hit a series of red, green lights and, and oh my God, all of a sudden I looked back, there weren't any SWAT team cars and Ron was in the driver's and he was not going to let this guy get by or get away from us. And so he pulled up right, there was a red light and Ron pulled up right next to him. Uh, and I was on this shotgun seat right over here. And he looked at me and he said, it's going to have to be you. I'm going, oh, I mean, it was my first real arrest. Everything else has been in the academy, right? And I'm, I mean, my God, I was scared. And my emotions was just like carrying, a, carrying, a, carrying away with me. And so kind of like that swimming board thing, you know, where I said, okay, I have to think this through. So um, I took off my raid jacket so he wouldn't know who I was and um, pulled my sweater over my gun and I don't really look like your typical FBI agent. So I got out of the car in this, in, at this red light. This is what, like 1984? This was something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Somewhere in there. And I just tapped on his window and I smiled and he kind of smiled back and I indicated he should roll down his window and he's smiling the whole time. And when he rolled down his window, I just, pulled up my gun and said, FBI, you're under arrest. And he was just so shocked. He, his mouth dropped open and his foot actually slipped off the clutch and his car lurched into the intersection. And, but I just followed him with my gun. And I, so I, I, I knew there was no way I could make this happen because he was such a big, he was a big guy. And, but it was like, okay, I'm going to stick with him. And uh, I kept my gun and I, he put, I said, put up your hands. And he did. And by this time, um, the SWAT team had just gotten out of their cars and were running down the street. So there wasn't some sort of shootout or something. And they did pull him out of the car and throw him to the ground and slap handcuffs on him like we had been trained in the, in the academy. But it was one of those times when I was just like, oh, my God, I have to think my way through it. I can't feel it, you know, because if I let my emotions take over, I'd be scared to death. Uh, but I had to th- put calm down my emotional, my fear, and just be as, as logical and as uh, <laughs> thorough as I could be. He, he but I wasn't prepared you. to, if he did, he did have a gun, by the way, I forgot to mention that he did have a gun. And, uh, you know, if he reached for it, I, I was, was, was prepared to shoot him. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, he didn't see you get out of the car. Like, were you literally just right next door and just hopped out in traffic? I I looked over. He was right here. I mean, we were side by side. uh, Right. And so I was in the passenger seat right next to him. So, yeah, I did. I I got out of the car. And I think he was not sure what was going on. He was looking ahead. But when I tapped on his window, you know, I just get his attention and then, you know, kind of you know, kind of winked and just said, roll down your window. I want to talk to you kind of thing. So it worked. It worked. What if he just, just drove off? I mean, if, if nobody was in front of him, I mean, nothing really was stopping him from just accelerating and driving away, right? He was at a stoplight. He was waiting for the stoplight. Yeah. So he could still risk it, I guess. I mean, do you, do you think you'd have shot him if he, if he accelerated? No. And- no, I would not have. Because at that point, uh, it, it's, 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 he's a fleeing kind of a fleeing felon right. and we're we're given he is armed and dangerous he's armed and dangerous but he's fleeing and if it's a it's a if it's a fleeing felon you you don't you just okay. don't shoot somebody uh, okay. in the back got you basically well technically it would kind of be from the from the side <laughs> from the side 
back, the the back left quadrant. Hey. So, I mean, it's kind of the yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, no, there were there was traffic. You know, he would. But you're a trained FBI agent. You could shoot it off the frame, the front, so the bullet hits him in the chest. So you're shooting him from the front. That's right, and I see that you've been watching a lot of good FBI <laughs> TV shows. Oh my goodness! Right. Um, yeah, that and contrary uh, to what those FBI sh- TV shows indicate, uh, it's really difficult for somebody smaller to beat the crap out of somebody who's a lot bigger. And this guy yeah. was a lot bigger than me. And I, yeah. So what what was the issued sidearm back then? What what was Your, that again? What, what was the gun they gave you? Oh, I came into the bureau with a Smith and Wesson, three fifty uh, three fifty seven. Oh, yeah. a little yeah. short barrel or. A- uh, it was a short barrel, and oh, we still gosh. had to qualify at the 50-yard line oh, with my a gosh. short barrel like this. So uh, I'll tell you a fa- funny story. That's hard I, to I was, shoot. I was very, I was a good shot, actually, because I trained the FBI way, right? But I, when I first started out at the 50-yard, and then, you know, you're down there trying to uh, hit the target, <laughs> and I looked at I go, Oh my God, I, I hit the target and I ran down in the burn behind us. It would have been uh, rain the day before. And all I did was spit up uh, uh, mud from where I'd hit too low. So it was like, oh my God, I've got a lot of work to do. That's a hard one. You know, I've got a, I've had a little Smith and Wesson 38, a little air weight, hammerless, you know, just good, just throw in your pocket. Yeah, I am not very good with that thing. I mean, it's hard. It's uh, it's hard, and the recoil. <laughs> we shot about three thousand rounds. Um, oh my gosh! The academy, and the recoil, as you know, at, yeah. But it after it, that it, it will leave a mark. It, it'll leave a mark on the bad guy. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it was a great gun. Uh, yeah, uh, those were the days when you had to load, you know. And now we've got uh, a Glock. I had a Glock 26 and um, I love that gun. Actually, I still have it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've got the, the, the magazines. And I mean, it, this yep. is a whole different game. Back totally in different. Days. It, was, it, was t- it was tough. Um, well, that had to be scary. Like I do, I do jujitsu, right? And I, mm-hmm. I didn't start till I was almost 47. Yeah. And I tell everybody, it took me, and these were just small in-house tournaments, which, I think in a way are worse than big tournaments because on an in-house tournament, you kind of know everybody, you know, some of the people from the other schools and they just cram hundreds of people in your little bitty gym. Mm. And so, and they, they tape it off like regulation, but like my very first one, like all of my coaches and friends, like literally like you're, you're on your back fighting this guy. And your guys are like uh, six inches away. Do this, do that. You know, uh, I was, it took me three tournaments to not just want to throw up and quit. Yeah. And that's a friendly, like not life or death situation. Right. Right. Right? You're playing for all the marbles. Um, Did, did your training kick in? Did, Did you feel like you were prepared for that moment? I did. I did. All the arrests we had made, at the FBI Academy, of course, we're compliant. Um, and it, we took turns being the bad guy, right? So you could ratchet up as much as you wanted, but mostly everybody complied because you want to make everybody look good. Oh, you know, they followed directions when you said, you know, step out of the car, hold up your hands. But I did find that the, the training, it was just, uh, it did just kick in. I didn't have to think twice because uh, there was a lot going on, but I had my stance. I knew what I wanted. I had my voice. Uh, I mean, you know, I was, it was my voice under control. Um, it did kick in and that's where training really, I mean, it really does matter. Mm-hmm. It really does. My, my son and I served um, a subpoena or whatever, uh, you know, notice to appear on a guy that it was his ex-wife's boyfriend, live-in boyfriend. And so <laughs> he hit us up. This was probably two years ago. And that was nerve wracking. And yeah. I mean, the the only comforting thing was the guy was older. And I mean, he was a white collar, you know, yeah, CFO of a big organization. So like, I wasn't too worried about getting beaten up. But um, it was you know, we had to wait. My, my friend had, he drew a map of where the guy lived and he had it as a gate, wasn't a gated community. It was private property, but his own gate mm-hmm. and nighttime. And we had to follow him and 
and I, my son's driving and, you know, I'm like, get up, get up before the gate would close. And, and, <laughs> and I, I show up and, and I, I went, I got out and I went way wide. I didn't want to like come up and ambush him any more than I had to. Plus like maybe he's got a gun. Yeah. Right. So, but I held that envelope and I kind of waved and I called his name and he's looking at me with these big, I mean, the guy was terrified. Okay. I know. <laughs> and I'm like, I say his name. He's like, no, <laughs> I'm like, yes, you are. I'm you like, are. Well, I lifted his windshield wiper and I put it in the front. I'm like, you've been served. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But I mean, I'm not trained for that. You know. Yeah. No, no. If you're not trained for something, but it's amazing how, how, how much confidence that gave me, even though I was shaking in my boots. Oh I just yeah. Wish I, had, I just wish it hadn't been my first arrest. I wish I had backup because Ron was in the car and we didn't know how long until the light switch turned. And in a way, it, you know what? I survived and I learned yeah. something about myself which uh, at the time I was just shaking, but I learned something about myself, you know, and I realized then I, if I put my mind to it, I could control that emotional limbic brain that just the the drama queen limbic brain, you know, that's always so emotional. So do you have tips and it's related in a sales sort of way um, to get the truth out of people because in sales people are always afraid to pick up the phone they're afraid of that tough negotiation they're afraid to stick to their price you know and and you know prospect will say oh that's really nice send me some information or you know what we'll get back to you or you know what go ahead we're we're getting three quotes go ahead and you know we'll, we'll let you know how you do i mean Oh, they said they'll get back to me. Like we, we, yeah. we trust too much. Maybe I think, cause we, we don't want to get uncomfortable and make that next call. But is there a, is there a way to get the truth out of people a little easier? Uh, just so we know where we stand. Right? I always tell people it's, it's not the, the no's that kill us. It's the, it's the indecision. It's the unknowns. Mm-hmm. Is this true. deal really going to close? I mean, here we are, you know, we got nine days left in the month, you know, in, in, in the quarter as well right yeah. oh this yeah. deal's going to come in like it ain't coming in man you, you know, know yeah you know i hear what you're saying uh i always start with that kind of question by just asking uh whether how how really aligned is that person with what they're trying to sell um because if you're not aligned with that pro excuse me, if you're not aligned with that product and or service or whatever it happens to be, it's going to be really hard for you to look somebody straight in the eye uh, and honestly say, this is a good deal. You need this. And this is what it can do for you. Uh, So that's always the first place. Again, it gets back to a little bit about values, but it, it, I could sell the FBI. Okay. Uh, And that's why I was spokesperson for four years. I could sell it. I believed in it. So um, that attitude is conveyed by the way we speak uh, and, and how, how we to relay our message. So that's always the first thing. And the second, truthfully, and I actually worked, uh, done a lot of work in persuasion, uh, is to meet that person where they are. It's so easy to let our own agenda bubble to the surface. And of course, you're in sales, it should bubble to the surface. But take the time to get to know that person. I know that sounds so trite. But the best salespeople I've met, actually and dealt with, uh, would call or get in contact would have nothing at all to do with what they were trying to sell me, uh, but had to do with an interest I had. Uh, for example, I love animals. I, I just adore them. Uh, horses, dogs. I grew up with them. They, I went to a, 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 a private school because our ranch was so isolated. I couldn't go to a regular school. So it was, a, um, it was just a little rural school, just my brother and I. So, I mean, when I say I love animals, they, they were my, you know, they're the, they were my friends until I was in high school. Um, and so when this person, his name is John, and when he found out, uh, he said, man, I, I found this great um, animal rescue 
right in your neighborhood. And he sent it to me. I'm going, wow, thank you. He actually listened <laughs> to what was important to me. And he sent me this and I, I, I didn't even need it, you know? I mean, I did, but I, I didn't, that it wasn't re- unrelated to what he was trying to sell me to be, to, to be truthful. And then the, the other way I found, uh, I was selling the FBI to a foreign spy, right? I mean, that's the bottom line. And so I had to find a way to gain their trust. And uh, a lot of it had nothing to do with the FBI per se, because I was selling myself. I was the FBI. I was representing the FBI. And all I could do was be true to who I was in that moment. Uh, I never lied to people. I never, I mean, I wanted them to trust me. So I developed a relationship with them uh, that was authentic. And you can always tell when somebody is trying to be who you think they want you to be, and it it just doesn't ring true. And I will say this, the only time I got into trouble working undercover was when I tried to be somebody I wasn't. You know, you could slap on whatever name you want uh, or title, but uh, the essence of who I was needed to be what seeped through. And that got me a long ways in an undercover work. Very interesting. Very cool. All right. Well, we are linking to your website. You've got a free assessment, right? The mental toughness assessment. I do, a mental toughness assessment. Absolutely. I'd love for people to take it. Uh, And your name is quite unique, so I will spell it. It's L-A-R-A-E-Q-U-Y, right? That's it. dot com, And then the assessment is there in your book. uh, It's on Amazon. It's everywhere. Secrets of a Strong Mind. How to Build Inner Strength to Overcome Life's Obstacles. Uh, Did we miss anything? Is there like a super secret story I should have asked you? (laughs) No secret, super, super secret story. Um, and I'd love to connect with people if they're on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, um, or, you know, through my blog, whatever. I'd love to hear from people. Sure. All right. I will link to all of that as well. Well, thanks for taking the time. I will, uh, I'm in Phoenix often. I, I will look you up. Dude, Are you a golfer? I'm not a golfer. All right. I, I used to be, I'm not anymore. Good. So we don't have to go golf. All right. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds all good. All right. Well, all right. Ray Kwai, all the way from Scottsdale. Thanks for coming to the show. It's been great. Thank you very much for having me as your guest. Have a great day. You too. Life was not fair. The FBI was hard on anyone who is weak. She was not good in push-ups, so she had to work on them. Don't try to make the road easy. Prepare them. Positive thinking is a cornerstone of mental toughness. So many good things in this. Get her book if you need to get tough. If you're not a reader, you want somebody to hold you accountable, call me up. Let's get after it. I'm not a shoulder to cry on, but I will help you get tougher. Okay? In all areas of your life. I was pushed in high school. I was pushed at the academy. I was pushed on active duty. I've been pushed as an entrepreneur been laid off multiple times, been on unemployment when two of my seven kids were born. I've been sued, been audited by the IRS, been audited by the California Board of Equalization, lost money in deals, been ripped off by guys, by friends, guys I thought were friends. I've had people work for me, take my intellectual property. I know, okay, I know, I know what, it, I know what it's like. I've spent at least three of my birthdays in the hospital with kids. Various things going wrong. No, nothing never came of it, but trip to the ER, fun, fun. I know. My now 16 and a half year old daughter turned three in the hospital with an undiagnosed ruptured appendix. Spent 15 days there while my wife was 38 weeks pregnant. I know. Been there, done that, got the t shirt. So, if you need help, I'll help you. But you got to let me know you're out there, okay? Get one of the courses. Reach out to me on the saleswhisper.com. Hit the contact us. We'll figure out a way to work together, okay? Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something.